Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, ladies and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Pursuant to NJSA 10 colon 4, the Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this duly and regularly scheduled meeting of the Jackson Township Zoning Board of Adjustment has been published and posted in all appropriate locations. Roll call, please. Mr. Hurley. Here. Mr. Stafford Smith. Here. Mr. Book. Here. Mr. Hudak. Here. Ms. Parnaz. Here. Mr. Hyman. Here. Dr. Holfstein. Here. Ms. Fritch is absent. Ms. Bradley. Here. Do we have any resolutions this evening? No. Oh. Uh, yes, we do. Actually, we have four of them. <coughs> All right. So I'll go through them since Jeff is not here. Uh, the first resolution this evening is resolution 2024-17. Uh, that is the resolution granting preliminary and final site plan approval on property located at 640 West Commodore Boulevard, block 2701, lot 35.01. Eligible to vote uh, are Mr. Hurley, Mr. Hudak, Ms. Parnes, and Ms. Bradley. I need a motion and a second. Second. Roll, Roll call. call, please. Mr. Hurley. Yes. Mr. Hudak. Yes. Ms. Parnaz. Yes. Ms. Bradley. Yes. Second resolution this evening is uh, resolution 2024-18. Uh, uh, that is the resolution uh, granting variance relief for a six-foot solid fence and denying other requested variance relief on property located at 26 Round Hill Road, block 10105, lot nine. Eligible to vote are Mr. Book, Mr. Hurley, Mr. Hudak, Mr. Stafford Smith, and Ms. Bradley. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Hurley. Yes. Mr. Stafford Smith. Yes. Mr. Book? Yeah. Mr. Hudak? Yeah. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Third resolution this evening is resolution 2024-19. That is the resolution granting variance relief for an in-ground pool on an undersized lot on property located at 26 Round Hill Road, block 10105, lot 9. Eligible to vote are Mr. Hurley, Mr. Hudak, Ms. Parnes, and Ms. Bradley. Second. Mr. Hurley? Yes. Mr. Hudak? Yes. Ms. Parnaz? Yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Our final resolution this evening, resolution number 2024-20, that is the resolution granting variance relief for a 12 by 20 foot storage shed at eight feet to side yard property line where 15 feet is required. On property located at 9 Abbey Road, which is block 2801, lot 23. Eligible to vote are Mr. Book, Mr. Hudak, Mr. Stafford Smith, Ms. Parnes, and Ms. Bradley. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Stafford Smith? Yes. Mr. Book? Yeah. Mr. Hudak? Yeah. Ms. Parnes? Yeah. Ms. Bradley? Yes. That concludes the resolutions for this evening. Do we have any minutes this evening? No. I do have a voucher from Jackson Township for the recording secretary for this evening in the amount of $175. I need a motion and a second, please, to pay the voucher. Move to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Hurley? Yes. Mr. Stafford Smith? Yes. Mr. Book? No. Ms. Mr. Hudak? Yes. Ms. Parnaz? Yes. Mr. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Do we have any announcements this evening, Mr. Murphy? Uh, none that I'm aware of. Okay. So <laughs> can we move forward with swearing in the professionals? <laughs> Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please raise your right hands. 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony, information, questions, or comments that you're about to present before the board will represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. I do. If you'd each please state your name and position with the board. Evan Hill, board engineer. Ernie Peters, board planner. Gina Tumalo, assistant zoning officer. Thank you. I believe there is no executive session for this evening, Mr. Murphy? That's correct. Any matters for discussion? No, Madam Chair. And no administrative approvals? That's correct. All right, so we're going to move forward to applicant number one, Jonathan and Ruthie Zelmanovich. I apologize if I butchered your name. Variance 3498, block 6501, lot 19, 87 Bates Road. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Will both of you be testifying this evening? Yes. Okay. If you would each please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony, information, questions, or comments that you're about to present before the board will represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I agree. If you would each please state your names, your full names, spell your last name, uh, and provide your uh, affiliation to this application. My name is Jonathan Zelmanovich. That's the last name is spelled Z-E-L-M-A-N-O-V-I-T-C-H, and I am one of the homeowners. Ruthie Zelmanovich, Z-E-L-M-A-N-O-V-I-T-C-H. I'm a homeowner. Both property owners, then. Property owners, yes. Very good. Thank you very much. You do, Okay. Um, would you like to tell us what it is you'd like to do with your property? Yes, I would. Um, we're here tonight seeking a, a variance to place a, a swing set in the front yard where it is not permitted as opposed to the backyard where it would usually go. Um, the reason we're looking to do this is because of the unique um, topography of the backyard, which is sloped front to back and also quite um, curvy and hilly from side to side. I, I believe we have some pictures here. I don't know how to get them up on the board. Um, when we began looking into what it would take to modify the backyard to um, create a space that would accommodate the swing set, it became clear that it could quickly become pretty costly. Um, retaining walls and things like that uh, easily cost thousands of dollars, could easily meet and exceed the cost of the swing set itself. Um, additionally, we have a sprinkler system on, on the property, both in the front and backyards, and depending on where the best space, you know, topographically speaking, would be to make alterations to the grade, it would also potentially involve messing with the sprinkler system, having to dig it up, having to change things around. And it's for that reason that we thought that maybe we could put it in the front. Um, we don't believe that putting it in the front affects anyone's lives in the neighborhood other than the appearance of it, um, which we believe is mitigated by several factors. Um, the first is, um, I believe we ha also have a, a survey on the record, that the, our home is, the, the setback in the zone is 40 feet in the front yard. Um, our home is way further than that. It's over 120 feet set back from the front property line, which creates this sort of expansive front yard. You know, not, it's not, the house is not enclosing the front yard, you know, up in, very close to you when you're on the street. And the proposed location of the swing set would actually be, obviously there is no front setback for an accessory structure because they're not allowed, but the, the proposed location of the swing set would actually be beyond the 40 foot setback that a principal structure would require, meaning that it's not, if you're on the street, it's not in your face, it's not on, on top of your head, it is somewhat set back into the property. Additionally, um, between us and the adjacent neighbor that the swing set would be near, there's a line of trees that, well, I have a different picture, sorry, of the, um, of the front yard also, which will show you that it's perfectly straight and long. That picture would also show that there's a line of trees there. By no means, I don't mean to misrepresent, it's not a, you know, a line of hedges that creates perfect privacy, but it is a formidable, barrier between the properties, uh, which does create a sense of separation and a sense of privacy. Additionally, th that blue arrow is the location that we're looking to drop it into. There's also sort of four or five trees surrounding that area, which again, obviously uh, don't create privacy. People can still see it, but it does create sort of an area where it's sort of nestled into and it's somewhat obstructed. So as opposed to a swing set that's right on your head when you're on the street and is unobstructed totally, um, it would be sort of set back pretty far and nestled away. Um, lastly, I would just like to say that this is my first time doing anything like this, so in preparation we, we watched a couple of, of meetings, and what I thought was very fascinating was that obviously the board spends a lot of time 
um, analyzing the technical details of applications, diagrams, and site plans, and all that minutia, which, we, which you would expect. But it jumped out at me that the board spends an equal amount of time um, reading between the lines and looking sort of through the application and trying to visualize the reality of how, how a property looks and functions and affects people the way it is and how the zoning ordinance affects it and how any changes would affect it. And to that, I would just like to say that uh, we've, we've been living here for, for over three years. We moved in uh, December of 2020. And the, the lived experience of being in this house, which we love, is that the backyard doesn't get used, except when it snows in the winter for sledding. The kids just don't play. You can't run a few feet without hitting a hill, without tumbling over. It just doesn't get used. And my wife, uh, who loves spending time, loves spending time the outdoors with the children, uh, you know, as soon as it gets warm enough, until it gets too cold, is outdoors in the front yard, 95% of the time. And kind of the the macro issue that we're having is that even if we could find a way to put the swing set in the back, um, if we could make it as small as possible, and we could find an area that would require the least amount of grade work or landscaping and make it the cost reasonable, it would still sort of be like superimposing and shoehorning a swing set into a backyard that doesn't lend itself to other uses. And my wife just wants to be able to go outside and watch all the children. If she wants to push the baby in the swing and also make sure that our you know, six-year-old who doesn't want to be in the swing, she wants to be doing who knows what, riding her bicycle in the front driveway, just that she can have one place where she could watch everyone together. And even if we could have the swing set, the rest of the backyard, the kids just, just don't play in it. Um, and for those reasons, we are seeking relief from the board. Thank you. Evan, do you have any comments for us? No, I, I like to actually thank the applicant. That was very thorough, concise, and very methodical. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, it was, I, I enjoyed listening to it, to be honest you. with you. Usually I'm stepping applicants through the process. Um, the applicant hit all the major points that I was going to point out to the board. Um, I, I did not have the benefit of seeing the, picture, the pictures of the rear yard, um, but I would agree that the topography is challenging to develop. Uh, I would also agree that uh, with the applicant's testimony that there are there is quite a bit of vegetation, like mature vegetation within the front yard and also along the side yard between the adjacent lot. It's not going to provide a 100% visual screen to the swing set, um, but it would it 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 does help dampen the effect of it and kind of camouflage it a little bit. Uh, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about the swing set. I mean, you could, there's obviously different variations and versions, but if you could explain to the board what you have envisioned for the swing set. Sure, I, I meant to add that I realized that we did give in um, a rendition of it, which might be in the record, but I, I don't think we gave it any dimensions at some point. That's a rendition sideways. Um, the dimensions of it are, 26 feet in length. Um, at its widest, where the slide is, it's 14 feet. Uh, the rest of it, where there's just the legs coming out, it's eight feet front to back. And I was told it's seven feet tall. Um, the tower, like when you're picking the swing set, they give you different tower sizes. The tower height is supposed to be five feet. So I, don't, I, I would imagine it might be more than seven feet because I don't think a two foot sort of railing on top of the tower would be safe. So I, don't, I think it might be a mistake. But, okay. I would say it's eight feet tall. And so typically, these types these these are considered temporary in nature. These these types of improvements, they do not require any footings or foundations. Uh, I'm assuming you're not going to put a concrete slab under it. It might just maybe just leave it grass or mulch or something along those lines. We really need mulch. Yeah. mulch. Mulch. Okay. Um, and I would agree that you don't need to do any, it wouldn't appear that you have to do any significant grading within this area, probably just level out the playing surface with the mulch that you put right. down. Do, do we have any, Mr. Hurley? Technically, it is because even a even a shed, if it's under 200 square foot, doesn't require a foundation, and it's still considered an accessory structure to the principal use. 
uh, I think historically um, zoning permits have been applied for for recreational type uses, swing sets and some things. Most of them are in the backyard. That's why we don't see them here at all. Although we have seen applications for this for front yards on a corner lot. Now we've seen one or two of those probably within the last several years. It's it's not a, it doesn't require a footing and a foundation from a building permit from an IBC standpoint, but it's still considered a structure from the in the zoning ordinance. Any additional questions for the applicant? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, if it's considered a temporary structure, uh, once you give it a variance, how does it run with the land? The, vari <clears throat> the variance runs with the land, right? So what you would be doing in this case is that the resolution, if you were to vote favorably, the resolution would be crafted to, I, to indicate that it's it's for a swing set of approximate dimensions based on the, you know, as depicted in the exhibits, located uh, 15 feet from the property line, 45 feet to the front yard, front property line. And that's all the variance is for. It's not for, nobody can come in later and put a shed there or a garage. It would be specific to this swing set in this location. But it can be replaced with another swing set this one ends up in the You have to use trailer. your mic down? You have to use yeah. your microphone. I can't hear uh, It will end up in the, uh, eventually it'll, it'll be removed because it'll fall apart. And uh, does that mean anybody can come along who buys the house or lives in the house, uh, put another set in similar to this? As long as it's consistent with the approval that was granted, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, to the applicant, uh, no matter how well hidden the swing set is, Word will get out to the neighborhood. How do you prevent kids coming there and playing on the swing set and, and all the kids just doing what they want to do when you're not home? Uh, you know, preventing an accident from happening. I don't, I don't have a great answer to that other than everyone's swing sets in their backyards are also open all the time and the same danger exists if they're not home. In the neighborhood, you're playing with a roulette wheel. There. I think, Mr. Hofstein, Mr. Hofstein, if I may, I, yes. the, the applicant did testify that they they currently use their front yard area as their primary play area already. That doesn't require a variance. They can put zip lines up in the trees. They could climb the trees. They could do whatever they want in their front yard and play, whether it's their kids or all of the kids in the neighborhood. Um, the bat, and I would agree that the backyard is not conducive, although it could be a lot of fun when they get older, it's not conducive to, for smaller children playing in the rear yard. Well, I just wanted to mention, I know it has nothing, nothing to do with the variance. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, have, have you had anybody look at the back to see if you can add fill or remove some, some of the uh, uh, a lawn there and flatten it out or put in a platform where you can put this structure and keep it in the backyard? We had, we had some general discussions and it, it seemed like it was going to be costly and prohibitive to do. That's why we were, came here. But you could do it if you wanted to. Yes. Okay. Any additional questions for the applicant? Uh, the chair, your survey shows a a yes. In the back? A massive shed in the back. Mm -hmm. still there? Yes. What's the size of it? What are the dimensions of the shed? I don't know offhand. It's very tall. Um, I, I'd be guessing the exact length and width. In terms, can you, Anthony, can you bring up the picture of the backyard here? So from this viewpoint, are you standing in front of the shed looking at the back of the house? <laughs> I didn't take the picture, but that's what it appears like. How much farther back is the shed, uh, given that perspective? Because it looks like the ground starts to level off as you go back towards that shed. And if the only real, the only real issue, so to speak, and that's debatable, are those two mounds. So it looks like it flattens out. Is it not? Is my perspective incorrect? 
I would agree. It, it does look like it flattens out, and it does flatten out relative to those mounds. I would say th this picture was not taken for the purpose of this hearing. This is from the Zillow listing of the house, which is still up, which means it was taken presumably to try to enhance the attractiveness of the property and try to, to minimize the appearance of the slope. I mean, you could say that it's tricky to see slope in pictures, and you're right, it definitely is less sloped than those mounds, but it still is sloped. And I believe that it might be more sloped than the picture makes it appear. I would also say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sir. so these are not your pictures; these are Zillow's pictures. This is; mm -hmm. these are publicly available pictures on Zillow. Yeah. Um, just for the purposes of the record, um, do these photographs accurately accurately depict the current? Um, yes. Uh, situation in your backyard. Yes. I mean, there might be, you know, like the lawn chairs might be gone or the flowers on the deck, but nothing significant is different about the backyard. Okay. So you're just using these to demonstrate to the board the topography, but these really aren't evidence, correct? I guess so. Okay. So the chair. Sorry. I did go to your property. I didn't go all the way in the backyard because I don't want anybody to think I was trespassing. <laughs> However, I did peek enough. It does, Mr. Book, slope. It does level off some very close to the shed, but this is very accurate. I did look at the pictures online as well because I didn't want to go all the way in the backyard, but it is very accurate. I was gonna. I was gonna add also that that even if that place right in front of the shed also it, it would be blocking the shed. So, okay. so I, I just wanted to say that I did go to the backyard and to check it. Um, and uh, th right in front of the shed itself, it does flatten out, but it would have to be put right in front of the shed, blocking the entrance and exit to the shed, which would then take away from the shed itself. But definitely it is flat right there, but it's not like you could really put it there. But uh, the, act the, the actual picture is the way it is currently. So I, I was not intending to you know, bring something that doesn't represent the uh, current state. I'm not a photographer and they were there. Mr. Hurley, did you have something else you wanted to add? No. Any additional questions or comments? I just have a question. Sure. So I'll give you my quick engineering response based on my experience here. Uh, the answer is no. Every application has to has to come, every application that comes before you has to stand its own, on, on its own merits. For the same uh, for the same reason why people, we haven't had people come in and say, well, you gave a you gave a variance for this corner lot. I am a corner lot. There were, yeah. we we don't see that. You're not setting any precedent because you're only acting on this application only and none others. You're not creating policy here. Yeah, yeah as, I, I oh, go ahead. Ernie. As part of the C variance relief, they've provided testimony that shows that they have existing topographic conditions that uniquely affect this specific piece of property. So it's sort of black letter law that they've shown you situations that affect their particular piece of property and limit what they can and can't do. So from that perspective, they've provided the proofs if the board were to act affirmatively. Um, we talked about the idea that it's a structure, whether it's temporary or not. Um, it's a structure. You could pick it up. You know, there, there's as much likelihood of someone picking it up and putting it in the backyard as picking it up and putting it in a truck. It's a temporary structure. Um, the issue that this board often deals with is, is it safe? Right? If someone came in the Brookwoods where there's a 35-foot front yard setback and tried to put one in the front, it'd be 10 foot off the sidewalk. <laughs> Here it's 100 feet from this roof. 50 feet from the street, correct? Correct. And it's wooded. Um, so the applicants have come in and recognized that, or reconciled to the board, it's not a safety concern for them. Now, while these can be an attractive nuisance, um, they've indicated that they already use that portion of their yard for recreational purposes. So. 
the only item that I might bring up to the board is the idea that there shouldn't be any expansion of this area. This shouldn't grow. We should end up with timber ties 10 feet around it, and all of a sudden we have play surfaces and then a four-foot fence, and then we decide to put a little gazebo out front and a sitting area. You know, this accessory structure requires a variance. They come back for anything else, requires them to stop back here again, pay the fees, come in, visit their neighbors, and go through the process again. They've provided testimony, I think, that would support the request for the variance. Mm -hmm. I think there should, it should be recognized that there probably isn't going to be the same argument to expand it into your real backyard, putting a deck, putting a gazebo, um, running water and you know, putting a wet bar out front, those sorts of things. But I do think that from the, and, and I'll let Ryan speak to this, I do think they've given the testimony that's set forth in the municipal land use law in order to grant the C variance for the board. Yeah, I mean, uh, from my perspective, um, I echo everything that both Evan and Ernie placed on the record. Uh, the C1 variance criteria, which is the hardship, uh, which is the hardship variance found NJSA 40 colon 55D um, dash 70C1 uh, is the hardship variance, and, th and that states um, that if there are you know unique topographic features. Um, to uh, to a property, we can grant a variance um, uh, to alleviate the hardship, uh, the the constraints caused by the hardship. Um, I, I echo Ernie's sentiments. I think that we've established that the topographic features of the backyard are such that, um, without great length and great expense, um, can be corrected, and and they have a perfectly you know, flat, good front yard where they, again, um, I'll ask this for the record just so I have clarity. You're not requesting any other setback variances or things like that, correct? No, no side correct. yard setbacks, no, no front yard setbacks. Correct. Correct. So again, they're complying to the best of their ability with the, um, with the bulk requirements in the zone. Um, and again, due to the fact that the, the backyard is, is very clearly sloped and very clearly has several, I would characterize as medium-sized hills, you're not going to be able to put a, put a place up back there. So, so from my perspective, they've satisfied, um, you know, the C1 uh, variance criteria. Uh, the only consideration is what are the detriments, and as Ernie um, had uh, used a, a fancy legal term, uh, attractive nuisance. Um, you know, that, that is a consideration that the board wants to, to, to take into account. Um, you know, can we condition anything to minimize uh, that potential detriment? Um, but again, is that detriment really substantial in nature? And that's really what the, the statute requires is that, you know, the, the detriment itself has to be substantial in nature. Um, it can't just be a potential detriment. Um, so that's something the board would have to weigh. Um, also, does it impact the zone plan and the zone ordinance? Um, you know, again, uh, that's something the board has to weigh. So, um, in my opinion, the, the, the applicant has satisfied the positive criteria for C1 variance. Through the chair? Yes, Mr. Boat. Yeah. Councilor, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and it seems like it should be such a little thing. You know, they want to put a nice swing out in the front yard. But, you know, we go through these applications for hardship variances. We try to apply what the code says to, to everybody across the board. And, you know, and maybe I've got the wrong reading, but I pulled up the C1 variance, mm -hmm. and, and, you, and if I read it wrong, tell me. But this is this is the wording that I that I that I read. Uh, this is uh, 40 colon 55 D 70 C, where quote A, by reason of exceptional narrowness. That's the word in the, in, in the code. Exceptional narrowness shallowness or shape of the specific piece of property, B, or by reason of exceptional topographic conditions or physical features uniquely affecting a specific piece of property, or C, by reason of an extraordinary and exceptional situation uniquely affecting a specific piece of property or the structure lawfully existing thereon, 
the strict application of any regulations would result in peculiar and exceptional practical difficulties too, or exceptional and undue hardship upon the developer of such property. Close quote. Those parameters are, 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 are fairly significant. I, if I understand the hardship statute correctly, I mean, it, it, might, it might inhibit their ability to use the rear of the property to the extent they want to, but we don't see measurements out there. No, I we don't see stakes or anything to that effect out there to show that, that there's no conceivable way that that could be put out there um, and, and, and comply with our statute. So, you know, I'm struggling with that. Sure. The, on one side, I just want to say, yeah, absolutely, don't put that thing out in your front yard. But do, do we do the evaluation different when we're looking at hardship? Because this is you know, a very nice couple and a beautiful family, it's a beautiful piece of property, and they just want to enjoy the front yard with their kids, or not? So that's my struggle. Again, you know, uh, Mr. Book, I, I'm not going to debate the statutory language with you. Uh, that is what the statute says, just as you read it into the record. So, yes, I mean, the, the idea that it's exceptional, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in its topographic features, that's something the board has to make a determination on. Again, this is a case-by-case -case basis. We can see the property. We can see what it looks like based upon the photographs um, that were uh, submitted by the applicant uh, to to give us an example of what they're what they're they're referring to when they talk about the topographic conditions, whether or not that's exceptional um, to the extent that it's permitted by statute. That's up to the board. I can't I can't I can't weigh in on that. For the um, chair, for the chair. So I I think I've told the board this over the years many times. Engineers can design just about anything to work, right? It may not be the prettiest thing and it might not be the most practical, but we could always design, some, design something to work. <laughs> and in this case, I think you have to go to what would a reasonable person expect to do to put in a, I don't know, maybe a $2,000 swing set, maybe a $1,000, whatever it is. Let's say it's a $2,000 swing set. If, a reason, if, if somebody had to come in and regrade their backyard, redo their sprinkler system, install fill, Restore all that ground surface from the from from the front to the back, plus possibly an asphalt driveway that got, would have gotten chewed up from all that fill and heavy equipment coming in. Um, you know, you're talking about spending five, six, seven thousand dollars for a thousand dollar or two thousand dollar sprinkler um, playset. So it goes to that reasonable person test in my mind as an engineer. Would it, is it reasonable for me? It, and I go, what I do it, what I spend all that money to put a thousand dollars swing set in. I don't have kids, so I wouldn't do it anyway. But <laughs> if I did, I most likely wouldn't do it either. Um, so now, if how that plays to the exceptional uh, aspect of things, I think that I think that's in my mind, that's how I reconcile what's exceptional versus what's practical, and uh, that's just food for thought for the board to entertain. Yes, Mr. Hurley. I guess my difficulty here is I'm having trouble believing this is exceptional. It came to us and I said, look, we are I don't believe so. Now it's on. <laughs> I'm having difficulty believing this is a structure, quite frankly. Uh, I, I, I accept, you know, our, our consultants telling us it is under, under, the, under the ordinance. But, I mean, if, if someone was building, you know, a couple of concrete elephants on the entrance to the, to the property, I can see that that might be a structure. But, you know, a, something that's temporary, like a, like a, a play set, to compel the residents to come to ask for a variance, to me, does not make a lot of sense. I mean, it's something that can be moved. And we're going to say, okay, it has to be in this location because that's where you told, it, told us it's going to be, and it has to stay there now and forever, yeah, is um, tough for me to swallow a little bit. I mean, if I wanted to put up a, a let's say there's a holiday, 
and I wanted to put up a, a statue or a, uh, I'll call it a statue, maybe three feet high, four feet high, that I just put in the ground. That's a sta is that a structure that I need to get a variance before I do that? It, it sounds a little difficult to me, so I, you know, it, it's just a matter of, yeah, yes, I, whether it's a C1 or a C2, I don't even think they should be here. I don't even think they have to be here. But having said that, I guess uh, they're here, and we're, we're told that they have to be here. So, you know, whether, whether it, it meets the hardship uh, standards or not, it meets the hardship standards in the rear yard if they were to put it in the rear yard. I can understand that. It doesn't meet the standard for the front yard, for C1. For C2, then it becomes, and as, as Mr. Hill indicated, you know, it becomes, is it reasonable? Reasonable is always a question of fact. I've met a lot of unreasonable people in my life. Um, but, you know, uh, something like this, I think it just creates a, a different kind of a problem for us. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of granting this variance. I just, my problem is I don't even think they should be here. Thank Madam you. Chair, just for the record, um, the reason the application's here is because it was denied a zoning permit by the zoning officer. <coughs> and the zoning officer on the front of your application clearly states that they're proposing an accessory structure. So the determination was made by the zoning officer. Um, Evan and I, Structures defined in the, in the code. Whether or not we agree with it, yes, that this could in theory be a temporary structure. We don't deal with that, unfortunately, in the code. The code defines a structure, and Jeff said you're putting an accessory structure in the front yard. That's the reason the application's here. Just I mean, through the chair, one, one yes. just to clear something up. Uh, when, when you were asking for a hardship uh, variance, uh, Basically, it should be the physical condition of the property. And uh, supposedly, personal hardship finances and otherwise don't come into play. Is that true? Personal finances should not come into play, but the cost to do something could. So whether or not they can afford to do it, that's one thing. It's, it's the, it, what, what, it, it, the, reasonable, the reasonableness test to me is, if I'm going to put in a thousand dollars worth of play equipment, would a reasonable person spend five to eight thousand dollars in order to do that? That's the reasonableness test, not whether they can afford it, but whether or not it's reasonable. There's a difference there, Dr. Hostein. Um, as far as the uniqueness and characteristics of the lot, shape, uh, shape comes into play. Topography comes into play. Ground surface could, could always come into play in certain instances, but those are characteristics that we would evaluate on a lot-by-lot -lot basis regardless of the improvements that are proposed. Thank you. I just wanted to clear that up, Ed, because he had mentioned that uh, he didn't look into how much it would cost him to do. Uh, look, look, looking at, at your backyard, it uh, looks like a great golf fairway <laughs> in the backyard. For the bunkers. And, Um, I think to echo Mr. Hurley's sentiments about, um, Mr. Hurley said, the <laughs> if you look at the backyard, it, it clearly um, it satisfies the hardship criteria of unique topography. Um, so, uh, and I think what uh, our attorney said is, you know, then we if it satisfies the hardship, um, we have to look at well, are there any negative impacts? I think the you know, have, having a place set in the front yard is uh, very uncommon. I don't think you, you know, see it anywhere. Um, but judging by the fact that it's nestled, you know, in a wooded area, set back, um, to me as well, it seems like it, 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 it kind of meets that uh, criteria. Those are my thoughts. Any additional questions or comments? I'm going to open this to public forum if anybody would like to come forward and make a comment regarding this application. Seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close, close public forum. Board, it's up to us for discussion and a motion, if possible. Madam Chair. Yes. 
I'd like to move to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Hurley? Yes. Mr. Stafford Smith? Yes. Mr. Book? Yes. Mr. Hudak? Yes. Ms. Parnas? Yes. Mr. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Congratulations, your variance has been granted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. We are going to move forward to applicant number two, Sean and Kyrie Murphy, variance 3500, block 1302, lot 13, 842 Heisen Road. Good evening. Good evening. If you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony, information, questions, or comments that you're about to present before the board will represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you would please state your name, spell your last, uh, and provide your affiliation to this application. My name is Sean Murphy, uh, M-U-R-P-H-Y. I am the current homeowner. My wife is out of town right now. And Mr. Murphy, why don't you tell the board what it is you're trying to do with your property? Um, basically make a lot of general improvements uh, and add um, kind of a hobby space, workspace for myself. Um, Currently, next to me and behind me are two paper streets, uh, which is why I'm here. Uh, normally, there would be a 15-foot setback for the side of my property, back of my property. Um, because of the paper streets, it's listed as a front yard on three sides. Um, all of that is wooded, uh, never been developed. It doesn't seem like it will be by the township. All properties around me are accessible from other roads. So um, what I'd like to do is, is build some storage um, I've done a lot of blacksmithing and iron work in the past. I like to do that as a hobby. Uh, some things I want to build for my own property, um, things to improve the house, um, mainly want the workshop so that I can actually improve my own house and uh, get it a little more up to par. It's 30 years old and it hasn't really been updated yet. So I like to do that myself. Um, but I can't do it without the space to do it. I also don't have a garage to park my vehicles in which is why I'm asking for the attached garage on the house as well. So um, mainly that's, that's the reason I'm here. Um, we also have, have pets, and I want to make sure my dog stays in the yard, which is the reason for the fence. Just to get everything on the record, be clear, because it's a lot on your application, so just bear with my questions. So the first thing listed is the six-foot solid fence proposed in the front yard area where it's permitted. This is facing Heisen and the side to Gomberg, correct? It's, it's facing, the, the wooden fence is facing Heisen Road. Um, there is already a, the exact same fence that I will mimic um, from my house to the neighbor's property on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to continue that look uh, to where the chain link would start to enclose the rest of the backyard, which I don't want to encroach on that 10-foot um, uh, easement. So I'm keeping the fence within that 10 feet off the property line so that I'm not on that conservation easement. All right. And then the, um, I know you also mentioned the attached garage to the house. That's the 26 by 26 by 19, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, like I said, it's a lot, so I just want to make sure I understand. I did look at the property, so I just want to make sure I have everything. Yeah. The, um, the reason I list 19 feet is, um, the house is on a pretty good grade. Um, as you can tell from this picture here, I took it from across the street, so you can see the front yard is similar to theirs, very wooded. Um, the house is a full 160 feet off the actual white line of the road. Um, the uh, attached garage would actually uh, level down a little from the front porch, about three to four feet. Um, I haven't gotten engineered drawings or anything yet, but this is, I, I, once the zoning is done, then I'll go with that step. I want to make sure I'm approved before I spend all the money on that, obviously. But um, the reason for the 12-foot ceiling is so that I actually mimic the ceiling of the house so that I can make a small mudroom in that garage and have an entrance directly into the house is, is the overall plan. And then um, the above-ground pool. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I know there's an existing deck, correct? Yes. The existing deck is the one that uh, says first floor deck attached to the house. Um, 
there's a couple pictures of the backyard. You could probably see it. The proposed deck would just be at pool level. Um, I just want to do the above ground pool. I don't feel like I need the expense of an in ground pool. And uh, the wiring and um, circuit is already there. Uh, the previous homeowners had an above ground pool and it was demolished before I bought the house. Um, so my idea was to put another one in and actually have a nice area around it because my wife likes to sunbathe. And the pole barn is the detached garage? Yes, ma'am. That's going to be the, work, the workshop you mentioned? That's correct. So that will have full electric. I'll do a foundation and poured slab for that. And why don't you tell us a little bit about, I'm sorry? Well, it won't need a foundation, I guess, if it's a pole barn, but I will put a slab inside of it. So I'm sorry I misspoke. So for the chair, can I ask a question yes. regarding the pole Please. barn location? Uh, you know, the, the reason why the pole barn, actually the reason why most of these, all these variances are required is <clears throat> because of the front yard between the existing dwelling and Gomberg Avenue. That's that's the front yard that, that's being improved within. Uh, you. You, you could conceivably move one, or it appears you could conceivably move the pole barn and even the Q hut further off Gomberg Avenue, so you don't need a variance for those. Is there a reason why, uh, can, can you explain to the board why you maybe can't move them further in your yard? Um, honestly, it's a matter of preference. Um, there's no reason I can't specifically do it. Um, I am trying to keep them um, as far away from my neighbor's property um, just for one noise and two just consideration. Um, I also, as I stated um, in my opening, I don't believe that Gomberg Avenue is ever going to be a developed street. Um, my backup as, as uh, that statement would be to request that the um, township vacates the property, which I know I, I know what proper steps I have to take with that. Um, so that, that's, cons to answer your question, it's more personal preference, so I'm not okay. taking up more of my backyard. There's already a swing set, actually. Um, you can see in that picture where that building would go. Not that I can't move that, um, but it's just. Madam Chair, yeah. sorry, I, I apologize to do this to you. There's an application on the April 17th agenda for Marcy Genora, block 1401, lot 11 on Gomberg Avenue in the R1 zone, seeking a variance to construct a single family dwelling. So someone is, and I don't know where that is in relation to That's the across property. the street. That is an already developed street. That's a different block, um, completely different set of lots. Uh, does the not is, neighbor is order, my property. In order for them to, unless they front, out on Heisen, they have to extend a road. No, sir. Okay. That, that is behind um, 830, 835 Heisen, I believe. Um, I did look both of those up, um, and I, I don't have uh, the image, but I did download the tax map on my phone. That is a currently developed dead end road across the street from Heisen from my house. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions for the applicant? Mr. Hurley? Mr. Murphy, I'm just, I'm just uh, curious about the garage that you want to attach. It's going to be attached to the home? Yes, sir. Is, the, is it going to have an appearance similar to that of the home? What's your, what is your intention there? That's exactly my intention. Um, I intend to make it look as if the garage was always part of the house. I don't want to have a walkway to it. I want it to share the wall of the current exterior wall of the house and as i said actually have a walk-in entrance into the living room of the house about the siding will it, will it match the, yes, the siding on the house? i'm going to get the whole house resided at at the time i do the garage along with the roof thank you you're welcome through the chair yes the average could be i missed it uh you also have on here a wood shed with a deck uh yeah the um that current woodshed that you see I will just relocate to the, lo the location 
on this um, variance request. So, so that's getting rid of variance also? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say that again. So that's going to be requiring a separate variance. They're moving this woodshed from currently the center of the backyard to the side. Part of, part of my reason for doing that, if, if you don't mind, um, is because I do just want to put a chain link fence up along this side. Um, I, you can't see them in this picture, but um, roughly where those metal U pieces that you see in this picture, that is the Q hut. I, I do already own it. Um, I just have not put it up yet, obviously, because of this. Um, so that wood shed would sit roughly where those are, sort of as also a visual block of the pool from the neighbors that you can see through the woods there. Um, and it would also block visually um, the view of the pool from the road because there's a curve there and the traffic kind of comes towards the house before it turns. So the shed itself you technically don't really need. You're saying you're just using it as to block the pool. I mean, you are, you, you are the, you're constructing a, you want to construct a garage which has plenty of space in it and then again you have a pole barn which also and then an additional shed. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it as an additional shed, not Understood. something that's existing because it's being put into that spot. So you're saying is that you're using that shed as well? That's necessary or? Uh, my thought process on that was um, any pool chemicals, any um, things that would be needed uh, for the pool, toys, things like that, would be kept in that specific shed since it was closest to the pool. Got it, okay, thank you. Through the chair. Yes, Mr. Hofstein. Uh, on one of the maps, the, the one we have where you're moving the shed, you indicate that there's a driveway, and on the map with all the yellow over override, you don't have it. Are you, are you planning on a separate entrance to the pole barn and the other building? Um, and, and I'm not, an I'm not entrance off Gomberg. I'm not sure exactly what, your, your, the original survey is what you're referring to? As, as opposed to my... It looks like something that was drawn up here. Was it one that I had drawn initially before I had to get... Could be. I, I don't know. It looks like it's probably from you. My... Okay, so I think to answer your question, um, my thought process is to, yes, use that area of Gomberg. There, there's enough area that I would be able to drive around to the side of my yard and have a 12-foot gate to be able to, if I had to pull a truck to that uh, pole barn in the back, um, that, that was my thought process. Uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that space, I would do some sort of a, uh, a gravel or something um, to where I wouldn't be driving on my grass and it would still be a permeable surface so I would not have to put pavement or concrete there. Is, I'm not sure if I answered what you were asking. Mr. Hill, is that, is that fine, what he's uh, discussing? So Gomberg Avenue is an unimproved road. Um, or it's considered an unimproved road. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's providing, uh, if it's providing an access to the structures in the backyard, there's no ordinance that says he can't do that. I'm not aware of any of the ordinances that would require anything beyond just a gravel driveway since there's no curbing, there's no sidewalk, that, that kind of thing. If he was proposing another access point onto Heisen Road, then I'd say it rises to the level of having to meet the driveway standards uh, for a single family home. But in this case, uh, I, don't see that be, I don't see that being necessary. This is more of a temporary use kind of thing, not an everyday use. Uh, I also look at it as this too. It, it's from a, from a safety and emergency and a safety perspective. It's actually advantageous to have some type of surface down that way. If 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 he gets hurt in his garage and has to call nine one one, an ambulance can pull right up to it. Right. So uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. But obviously, there's there's some safety issues there too. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hudak. The um, on the drawing, the building that's more. Is that really 43 feet to the peak? 43, 13 feet. 13 feet. Okay, looks like a 
<laughs> no, sir. I, I actually plan to, um, the face of that building, I plan to frame out to look like a regular garage as well to match the house. So it doesn't just look like a metal arched building sitting in the middle of the yard from the front. Yeah, the, the peak of that, I plan to be about 13. The actual Q hut itself is only about 12. Yeah, you looked at it, yeah. <laughs> Any additional questions or comments for the applicant? Mr. Hill, Mr. Peters, any comments? Chair, I just want just one clarification. He brought up the 12 foot opening for a fence. There is a fence or there's no fence there currently? Currently there's no fence. And you're proposing a fence? Yes. Oh, I missed that. The, I there I is the one in the front for six feet and the one in the back for five feet. I'm saying that's a little fence also. That's yes. five foot or six foot? The, the chain link around the remainder of the property would be a five foot chain link fence. All right, thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Okay, I'm gonna open this to the uh, public. Anyone wishing to make comment, please feel free to come forward at this time. Seeing no one come forward, I'm gonna close public session. Board, it's up to us for discussion and a motion, please. Madam Chair, for purpose of discussion, I'll make a motion to approve the application. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Well, for purpose of discussion, uh, I, I went and visited the site. I went again today in the rain. <laughs> And uh, I, I've got to say that looking, looking at, the, at the survey and the plan that's been provided and looking at the site itself, my first reaction when I saw the application was this is overburdening this piece of property. Um, I'm having some difficulty with the proofs that are required here for purposes uh, of the, the utilization and the, the, why it's necessary. I can understand the garage attached to the house. I, I don't have any problem with that. I understand that. Um, it's going to match the home. It will improve the character at least the, the aesthetic character of, of the area, no question about that. that that's a positive. Uh, as far as the, the necessity, and I know necessity is not an issue here. Um, but it, it just seems like it's, uh, my, my first reaction I said is overburdening the site. But then I went to look at the property itself. And I looked at the property, and you got these paper streets nearby. It's a unique uh, size piece of property. It did not seem that even with the the addition that is being proposed, that it that it has a negative impact on the character of that neighborhood. Uh, maybe if there's other types of development proposed in the area, that might change my mind. But I haven't seen any. I haven't heard of any. So. Um, As I said before, I think for purposes of discussion, I had, I had initial problems because of overburdening the site, but then looking at the area itself, it seems to be in character with the neighborhood. Uh, so that kind of, that concern has, has been taken away as far as I'm concerned. Those are, those are basically my comments. Right, but he put, when he made the motion, he said it was for discussion, so he was just making backup comments. Yeah, it's perfectly accept acceptable to discuss the motion while it's pending. Uh, I was trying to understand the, I mean, every one of these things are all the front yard or side yard. They still have that issue with it being, you know, requiring the variance. So what is the justification um, to approve them, even though it's only a paper street? I mean, if right now we do have a paper street, and down the road, the town does decide to develop, and then it is developed. 
then you have them existing there and they're all, like we're saying, you know, they're coming before us for those variances. So I'm just trying to understand the justification for them. So even though the lot is very big and it could fit it, I, don't, I mean, you know, the applicant said why they wouldn't want the shed um, or the pole barn to the right side of the property rather than the left towards the neighbor. I think that if that takes away a variance, it should be moved, although the applicant doesn't want that. But if there's no um, land use reason to specifically have it on the left side where it requires the variance, I don't see why it shouldn't be put on the right side. I'm going to respectfully disagree um, with that. I think it's, um, we've had, in my time on the board, we've had where we've asked applicants to move things or change their plans um, to accommodate the neighbor. So I, I kind of applaud the applicant for even thinking of that because, again, I, I was kind of like Mr. Hurley. This application was a bit overwhelming at first glance, and you're kind of like, whoa, this is a lot. So I had all these little notes written down, drove to your house. I'm looking around, I'm like, well, no, this is a lot bigger than I thought. It was a little confusing, these paper streets. I see, you know, the side of the house, and I'm like, tried to get around to the back to figure out how do you get to this other street. Um, had to be, get a little education from Mr. Peters, right? Um, but I don't think it's overburdening the property, but I do applaud the applicant for taking into consideration to the fact that he does and will have a neighbor on that side where even if at some point Jackson decides to develop Gomberg near him, or finish it, that's still just a street and not a neighbor that he would, could potentially be affecting. Yes, ma'am. I, I also, if, if I might add, um, plan to not just have this look like a pole barn in the end um, after I get a little use out of it and hopefully save up a little more, more, more money after doing all this, match the house also. I, I totally, I totally agree with your, you know, what you want to do, and I understand that. I'm, I, I get it. I'm just trying to, you know, from the justification standpoint, try to understand. From I, that. I, yes, I do understand. Um, as you can see with the pictures, my property is also very wooded, so to move these buildings, I have to take down a lot more trees. I'm trying to also avoid that. Right. No, I, I, I came down to the property, um, and I saw that. I saw you do have a bunch of trees that are marked. To be taken down. I'm not sure what those are. The, those center. I have applied for tree permit. Um, right. Has been approved. I haven't put the deposit down for escrow yet, but I do plan to replant. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Like, I'd like to make one other observation. Gumberg Avenue is an unimproved street. It's a paper street. Um, there's always the possibility that that paper street that the, it, it could be vacated by, by the municipality, which means that Mr. Murphy would get half of the width of that road, which would be an additional 25 feet. And if that were to occur, and I understand that, you know, that may or may not be a possibility. I have seen it done in the past. Um, and if it were vacated, each property owner on each side gets, gets a half of that piece of property gets deeded to them. Um, if that were to occur, he probably wouldn't need the variances, the, the, the bulk variances in, in, in any regard. So just a comment, just a passing thought. Any other questions or comments for the discussion? Okay. Elizabeth, uh, roll call, please because we have a motion and a second to approve. Mr. Hurley? Yes. Mr. Stafford smith Yes. Mr. Book? Yes. Mr. Hudak? Yes. Ms. Parnez? Yes. Mr. Hyman? No. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Congratulations, your variance has been approved. Thank you. We're going to move on to applicant number three, Spiros 
forgive me, Vlahos preliminary final site plan 831 had previous approved use variance 3350. This is block 2201, lot 52, 643 Herman Road. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Vince Halloran from Freehold representing the applicant. This one's not working, is There we go. Thank you. I'm sorry, were you able to hear? Is this working? Yes. Yeah. They're both working. You sit down. You want to sit? You want to stand? No, I'll sit. Actually, my only witness tonight is John Plaskanka who's an engineer, he's testified before on this application. I know there are new members to the board. Judge Hurley, I know you were here last time. I know Carl Book was. I think a couple of the rest of you. Uh, do you want me to have him, have him sworn? Thank you for raising your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony, information, questions, or comments that you're about to present before the board will represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you would please state your name, uh, provide your credentials, and your affiliation. Uh, John J. Pluskonka, P-L-O-S-K-O-N-K-A, professional engineer, professional planner, Manalapa, New Jersey. Uh, I'm the president of Concept Engineering. I've been the uh, president for about 50 some years. I've appeared before this board, boards in Manalapa, Freehold, Coltsnack, for the last 50 years. So this board accepts your credentials. Thank you. Thank you. you. John, would you briefly describe the status of the application? We have a variance approval. Tell us about the site plan. Yeah, the, the property at, at 643 um, Herman Road is in the um, commercial zone, commercial industrial, uh, LM, light industrial district, and it's been approved by this board in 2022 for a use variance for a, a storage of equipment and buildings on the property, uh, tra trailers rather. The, uh, at that time, we went through most of the application and, and the professional's reports, and we ended up with, I think, uh, Mr. Hurley, who was on TV, asking for a plan that showed how we would uh, provide for storage of the equipment and vehicles on the property. Uh, so that we came back to the board last year with the revised drawings. Because uh, the agenda was heavy, we finally got to a hearing tonight. And the applicant, again, is to, uh, there's a single family house on the property which was non-conforming to the zone, that's being used as an office, and then we're doing uh, storage of facilities such as um, scissor lifts, pickup trucks, tag-along trailers, box trucks, dump trucks, box trailers, and bobcats, and they're being stored behind the building, which is, a, which is the former house and they're being and there's four uh, eight by forty foot trailers for storage of equipment on both sides of the property. So that was the plan that was presented. We received the use variance to do this, and we said we had to come back for site plan of site plan approval. So we're back tonight with that other sketch. Can you show the other sketch? The sheet number two. No. It's, it's, that's it out there. No, there's another, there's another sketch that shows the uh, layout of the equipment I sent on.
So while well, 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 the engineer is taking his, uh, or getting his materials, uh, just there are members on this board that did not hear this application originally. The plans that are in front of you are, um, are the engineering plans, which to be honest with you, most of this information was on the prior plans as well for the, for the variants. <coughs> it just required some additional detailing. But as, as far as where things are and what, what's proposed on these plans, those are consistent with the variance approval already granted. So we're not here to reevaluate whether or not it's okay to have proposed pavement on the side of the home in that location. That was granted as part of the variance process because that's where it was depicted before. They provided some additional details, engineering details, to satisfy our comments in the, in, from that process. We're not here to reevaluate whether or not the trailers are in the appropriate spot. Those already have variances. We already granted variances for those. They are, <clears throat> what, what they did come back to, because this was a condition of the variance approval, they came back, they agreed to provide a more detailed plan at site plan stage to show the various types of contractor vehicles that are going to be stored within the gravel area in the rear yard, and that was provided to us as an exhibit, which is up on the screen now. So this, this is the first time this board is seeing this level of detail, but this area in general is allowed, you granted the variance previously, for the storage of vehicles. Uh, I, I would simply add, Evan, that the property is commercial. It has commercial to the right, has commercial to the left, has, has a commercial facility behind it, which we discussed before, which is zone residential, but it's a commercial uh, building in the back there and parking behind us. So we're all surrounded by commercial. We did agree to uh, pay into the pedestrian fund for the sidewalk and curb that's not being installed. And we've met the stormwater requirements. Uh, and we're gonna meet, I'm going to meet with Shari Spiro, the landscape uh, person uh, from the board. She's on vacation right now to go over what she needs us to do. And we'll work with her, as I've done for the last 50 years, to come, by, come back to your office and Ernie's office to show what we're going to do for her. There's no signage here, there's, and there's, we're not going to exceed the height of 10-foot uh, bulk storage. Uh, so we're respectfully requesting approval of the site plan. For the chair? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I don't want, I don't want you to, uh, I'm, this is not meant to provide testimony on behalf of the applicant, but it's meant to provide background to the members here. Who, who aren't familiar with the application. Um, the, the applicant is proposing some additional impervious cover, cover via additional parking spaces. The applicant had agreed during the variance approval process uh, to provide stormwater management measures for this site, even though what they were proposing didn't rise to that level, the threshold of requiring it. And the reason for that was the prior site owner put a lot of gravel down, also did some improvements out here. But if you look at the site in its totalitarity, now some stormwater measurements should be installed and the applicant has agreed to do that. So uh, the applicant's making up for other people not doing what they should have done in the past. So that's a good thing. Uh, the rear of the property is gonna, is gonna be a gravel storage yard for vehicles, for contractor storage. Uh, if I recall the testimony correctly, it was a, this was not to be leased out to others. This was a single occupant business use. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. And the activity level here is very limited. Usually there's two, three, four, five times a week. Someone comes in, gets a piece of equipment, gets some tools and leaves. So right. there's no, no one in the, in the uh, office all the time. It's very, very uh, lightly managed. Right. So this entire site is going to be essentially owner-occupied. There's no additional tenants. There's no leasing of space. This is a single commercial use surrounded by existing commercial uses. 
even though it's a residential zone. Uh, we did ask for some of the, um, we did ask for some additional, like I said, stormwater management measures, which they've agreed to install. Uh, we've asked them to make sure to uh, inspect and verify the condition of the existing septic system, and if anything needs to be done to that, any further improvements need to be done to that, they would coordinate that through the Ocean County Board of Health as part of resolution compliance. Um, We've asked them about uh, site lighting. Uh, I don't recall. Are you proposing? You're not proposing any site lighting just, at this point. Just security lighting. Just no, security lighting. No site. No site right. lighting. And this goes back to the hours of operation testimony, which was provided previously. Which was uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but it was a it was a daytime business use. It's not a nighttime business use. So there was no public that was going to be no public necessarily visiting the site in uh, in off hours. Uh, <clears throat> all in all, yes, we did generate a letter dated February 15th. I've spoken to the engineer, and we've had some correspondence. They've agreed uh, to comply with, with all the comments in the letter. A lot of them are carryover comments from the, the use variance hearing. Um, and, and from an engineering perspective, I'm satisfied that they've met the conditions of the use variance application, which was they would come back, file a preliminary final site plan application, which would address the board's concerns during that stage. I just have a question for clarification purposes. I read the resolu the prior resolution. We, I, I just want to clarify. We still, the, the board still needs to grant the lot area and bulk variances. Isn't that correct? I, I think only the D variance relief was was. I'll leave this to the planner. My understanding yeah. was that the C variances would have been subsumed with the. With they the should use. have been, but that's not the way the resolution reads. Okay, then I guess the I guess the preliminary and final site plan resolution, if the board were to approve it, should just reinforce that. I, I think that's appropriate for the resolution. That's why I'm asking, Mr. Peters. I think, Mr. Peters, I'm going to direct you to. One second, page five. I've got your report. We've listed the variances. Um, I don't recall whether or not the board dealt with them at the last hearing. If they did, Ernie, if you'd speak into, I have trouble hearing you. Pardon? If you could speak into the mic. I know. <laughs> I don't have a copy of the original resolution for the use variance. I would have thought that it would have subsumed the existing conditions. If it does not, then this would still be an existing undersized lot. Yeah. And if through an abundance of caution, we decide that they need to get these variances now, then they're going to need to give testimony with regards to what's listed in our report. Uh, here's a, I'm going to read the paragraphs, uh, at least that indicate to me that they were, for whatever reason, they were not subsumed at the time. Paragraph four of the resolution in the whereas clause states, the applicant seeks D variance approval to permit the conversion of prior single family dwelling into contractor's office and construction yard with outdoor storage. Paragraph six says the board did not address the need for any further variances, instead requiring an application to appear before the board for a subsequent site plan, application to address the use and design of the site in accord with the testimony and evidence presented and the conditions imposed by the board. The, the resolution of approval that the board granted on the 16th day of February 2022 that the applicant's request for variances, plural, is hereby approved subject to the applicant's compliance with the conditions and stipulations set forth below. Uh, that's what the resolution said. Um, the, uh, the variances, there were six pre-existing variances of lot frontage, width, area, et cetera, and then there were four variances for the, uh, I think for the four trailers that are being used for storage. And because the size of the lot is less than one acre, the zoning is three acres, so the amount of area available is de minimis. 
So we asked for the variances to leave a spot in the middle to have the storage of the vehicles uh, and equipment that you see on that plan in front of you. So the, it's a C variance for hardship because of the undersized lot in the three acre zone. And I thought that was granted before, but that's basically uh, the issue that the lot is small and the lots next door to us on right or left are also one acre. So this is a common problem with the narrowness of the lot in the zoning being only uh, so many feet wide where 300 is required uh, respectively. Yeah, I, again, I, from a legal perspective, I take no issue with the, the you know, the, the variances requested, uh, specifically the C variances, but I can tell you right now that based upon my reading of the resolution, they were not granted at the time of the D variance approval. So I just wanted to make that clear for the record. So I, I think they need to be granted at this time. Madam Chair, Lady, may I? Everyone knows how I feel about these bifurcated applications. So that the, the bifurcation aspect, generally the applicant comes in for the use, and if the use is granted, it's subject to site plan approval. Site plan approval uh, would then indicate whether or not there were C variances that are required, and the statute is clear. It says the C variance in the site plan part of the application or to be voted on as if it's just a C, not a D, which means it doesn't need a, a supermajority of the board to vote on it. But I, I think my, my concern is that when we get a bifurcated application and whether or not you get a reasonably adop, adapted concept plan, it's very difficult to make a determination as to whether or not the side yard setbacks should be granted at that time. For example, I, I, I would have a question of our engineer on tonight's application. I see on the map that there are, are a number of proposed spots for vehicles. Some are dump trucks and some are trailers or whatever they may be. But I'm curious how, how one gets to the other. You know, is there a circulation pattern here? Is there a circulation issue? And if there is a problem with circulation, maybe one of those spots has to be removed. And that should be taken care of during the site plan. Uh, I don't have any objection to, to the use. We've already granted the use. The issue is the site plan. And uh, Mr. Hill has always said that when we grant the, the, um, the use variance, it's still subject to site plan. It doesn't mean, in my opinion, it may be he may have a different one. It doesn't mean that we granted the C variances. It just means we granted the use. Now come back with the, the site plan. Let us take a look at it. Let's see if it's, you know, the internal circulation pattern is safe. You know, are you, are you going to have trailers that are, you know, double stacked and or triple stacked and one may fall on somebody? You know, these are things we have to take into consideration. How is it lit uh, for internal circulation patterns, things of that nature? So my only, my only question here is the, these lots, the parking spaces that are proposed here, and I'll consider them parking spaces. Um, how is the circulation taking part in the internal circulation pattern? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I could add the fact that I said before that my client has people come in to take out equipment. If there's uh, 15 pieces of equipment there, trucks, etc., they come in maybe in the morning, take a piece of equipment out and go back. So they can move things around very easily. Uh, and, and the activity level is maybe five or six times a week where someone comes here and takes some equipment and some tools, leaves and comes back. So it's a very inactive site except for that movement 
of that person coming in and taking a piece of equipment. So it's not like people are moving stuff around all day long. It's a, it's a select area with a contractor jarred that's used periodically. Well, I understand the concept. I really do. Uh, and I said before, I really didn't have any major problem with it in the LM zone. Um, my concern here is the safety now for the internal circulation patterns. You know, all we need is one person getting hurt. And then I got to say to myself, why didn't we think of that? You know, that these, these vehicles are stacked on top of each other. And I shouldn't use the word on top of, next to each other, but so close to each other that I'm looking at the plan that's on the screen now that how does one of those in the upper left-hand corner, how does that even get out of there? You have to move one, one piece of equipment to get to another piece of equipment. That's what the uh, employees do. He only has three employees uh, on his staff that come in very infrequently, and they will move a piece to get another piece out. And, and if are Evan all, Hill... Are, yeah, I'm sorry. Are, are all of these vehicles owned by your client? Yes. All of them? Yes. Only for his purpose. Correct. Uh, Mr. Hurley, if I can. Of course, that can, change, that can change with the ownership, and well, we, we I, granted the variances. You know. That my my com one of my comments in earlier the meeting was just confirming that the use in the use variance testimony that was previously provided that this is a single owner occupied business. He will not be leasing this premises out to any third parties or multiple parties or tenants. This is solely this purpose, this, this, this um, owner occupied. Um, when, I, when I see the circuit, so I want to go back a little bit too real quick. The plan that you have in front of you, not, not the circulation, not the storage plan, but the other plans, they're virtually exactly what we saw at the use variant stage. There was some little detailing that was done, but we saw all this before. There are no but surprises. We didn't, we didn't have a, a plan. We yes, a, we did. We had exactly what we you had. We had a concept. We no. had a concept. No, this application was originally submitted as a use and preliminary and final site plan application. Right. During the use, they said, you know what, we're going to come back with the site plan. But they had already sent, they already, so, but we've we, seen did this we already. Did, did we or did we not grant the, the site plan? The, the, no. No. Okay, so that's why they're here. Correct. But okay. you've seen this already. That's my point. If you were on the board at that time, you've seen this plan. All due respect to my age, I don't remember what I had for <laughs> No, I'm, I'm clarifying for the board that they've seen this plan. The only, the only plan you have not seen is the one that's up on the, on the, board, on the display, right. which is the circulation plan. But all the other plans that the board has seen previously. Well, that's my point. The circulation plan. How do how do they how do those vehicles circulate around each other? Well, it's a storage lot. So the testimony I've heard is it's storage. If 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 an, if the owner operator needs to go in there and and use one piece of equipment, and it just so happens a trailer might be in the way, they'll move the trailer to get that piece of equipment out, or vice versa. It's a self policing activity. Um, there is. I look at circulation as mostly from a safety standpoint can an emergency vehicle get back there if somebody if somebody uh, gets hit by a vehicle but's backing out yes they can an ambulance can come in it's unrestricted they've identified to me that an ambulance can get in there um, emergency vehicles get in there just fine so that's where on in these contractor storage yards I am more concerned about site safety from for emergency purposes than whether or not the owner operator of the facility has to move a car or a vehicle out of the way to back another one out. That's an operational thing. That's done in our own driveways every day. That's done in parking lots every day. And that's done in contractor storage yards every day. Well, parking lots every day, we see internal circulation patterns, just like on the, on the, uh, the parking spaces proposed in, in, by Herman Road there. You have an access road that tells you how wide it is. Uh, tells you the direction in which, which the, the vehicles are traveling. I don't see anything in the back. That was my only question. My only question, how do they get in and out? If you're satisfied with it as our engineer, if you're satisfied with it, you know, just say so and 
Okay. There's sufficient information on here that, for me to determine that there's adequate site sa there's adequate site access for safety and also for operations. Okay. Thank you. Through the chair. Yes. Just a question: the proposed trailers. Um, is there what's being stored inside of them? I'm just trying to understand if there's, for example, my just my concern is if there's a fire for some reason. Um, there's today hoverboards and all these lithium-ion uh, batteries, and if one of these trailers were to have a fire in it, how would a fire truck be able to access it if we have trailers all in front of it? Meaning, uh, I don't know, they're called trailers or they're just storage containers blocking those trailers. It's, it's my understanding that trailers are used for tools and equipment that they need on the job site. If they come in to pick up a uh, uh, dump truck and they need some other equipment from the trailers, they take the equipment out of there, be it jumpers or tools, etc., uh, and they close it up and that's it. To my, uh, I, I do not believe there's any uh, gasoline or batteries being stored there. Mm -hmm. Saying if there is, for whatever reason, a fire in there, what's the access if they're having containers in front of all of them? If there would be some kind of, if they would remove, you know, one or two of the containers in front of it, that there should be access to those trailers in case of emergency, I think that would be very beneficial. I think there's a room to walk behind the area, open the door, and get into the trailer. But I'll, I'll defer that to um, a discussion with Evan and Ernie as to if there's enough room back there and if we need to make an adjustment, we'll make an adjustment. Thank you. And, and also, uh, Mr. Hyman, just as, as, as part of site plan applications, the applicants required to submit these, the, the project documents, the site plans, to the traffic safety officer in town, which is the police department, the fire official for the district, um, environmental commission, and so on. But from a safety perspective, traffic safety officer and fire official, the applicant has done that. Um, I don't have in the package if you've received responses yet. I suspect you did back when you originally sent them out. We got some responses, but not all. Okay. We'll have to follow up for compliance as, as we always do. Yep. But they did. They, they met their obligation by submitting to the safety agencies, uh, and they're obligated to comply with any of those co any comments that may come up. Thank you. Through the chair, yeah. the applicant. Just if you would just clear something up for me, those units that are stored around the perimeter of that yard, are they more containers or trailers? Are they shipping containers without wheels, so they're permanently placed there, or are they subject to being moved around with tires? You, I'm getting a little confused as to storage and what's physically going to be on the site. Those are trailers that I believe have wheels on them to be moved in okay. and left there, but not to be rolled around the site. They're going to be permanently at that loca those, those locations. Okay, so they're per pretty much permanently located then. I'm sorry? Are they permanently located in a slot or are they subject to movement? They'll be permanently located as per the site plan. Thank you. Excuse me, isn't that different what we were told before? If they're permanently located, then someone said before that you know, some one of the workers would come in, move move the truck, or move the truck, or would do something. And when they were trying to, when when I asked about the internal circulation patterns, I was I thought you said that uh, the workers can come in, just move the truck, and get what they need or whatever. But now you're saying they're all permanent. We're talking about apples and pears. The four trailers are on the. Um, on the perimeters? Perimeter of the property. Yeah. They will never they will not move. But the vehicles, the equipment will be moved if necessary uh, to get to another piece of equipment. Okay, so it's the tra four trailers on a perimeter, uh, they're they're the ones that would be permanent. Correct. Okay, thank you. And th those four trailers are primarily storage. Correct. That's correct. And that that is what the use variance um, resolution indicates as well.
Any other questions or comments for the applicant? Madam Chair, I'll lay one question yes. of, of Mr. Hill. I, I read Mr. Peter's report, and he had indicated that the addition of some of these vehicles, um, does, it, does it create a problem for the impervious surface coverage? Is, are you satisfied with the, um, you know, the, 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 management, the, the water management plan here, stormwater uh, storm management? Yes, the applicant's actually um, gone, the answer is yes. The applicant's actually gone above and beyond what they're obligated to do, mostly to correct the clearing that has occurred prior to them taking ownership with the, for the, with the, uh, the clearing that occurred with the prior owner. So they're, they're making that wrong a right by putting in stormwater management measures. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if I missed something, but it seems like the trailers are up against the perimeter of the property. Is there, I'm looking at the required setback, I'm looking at it sketched out with like where the 30 foot and 50 foot setbacks are. Um, so the locations of those trailers were approved as part of the okay. use variance application. Any additional questions or comments for the applicant? Being that there's no, any, no additional questions, I'm gonna open this to the public. Anybody wishing to come forward and comment on this application, please do so. Seeing no one come forward, I'm gonna close public session. Board it's up to us for discussion and a motion if possible. Chair, Go ahead. I'll offer a motion for discussion. I'll second. For the chair, if I can just remind the board, this is the we are not here to evaluate this. The use variant, there is no use variance application here that was previously granted, so they have they have the right. They came back uh, to satisfy a condition for site plan approval. Uh, you've seen those plans before; they're a little further detailed now. So, um, and if, if um, uh, I would say, if you were to, uh, it, I would in recommend that in your motion, you incorporate any of the C variances that, that are required. <clears throat> there, uh, my understanding is there's no additional C variances on these plans than what you've seen previously, but Ernie's letter has a comprehensive listing of all the C variances that are required. But again, we're here for, for preliminary final site plan only. And that only requires a simple majority uh, to affirm and approve. I still had the same type of question. The D variance was granted, subject to site plan approval. From, if I understand you correctly, you're telling me that the C variances were also granted. They no, were I just subsumed. Said, no, 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 no. It's not, Go Mr. Hurley. I said nothing like that. Oh, I just said that the, this resolution should include the C variance language. Right. That's exactly what I just said. Okay, but we, it, they were in quotes, just for, so I'm clear, not subsumed into the D variance that, that was previously granted. I'm gonna leave that to Ryan, but that's not, my understanding is they were not. Okay. That's correct, that's how I read the prior resolution. All right, thank you. Do, does the board wish for me to put the C variances on, required on the record just for the purposes? Uh, number one would be the required minimum lot area is three acres, whereas existing is 0.916 acres. The required minimum lot width is 300 feet, whereas the existing lot width is 142.5 feet. The required minimum lot frontage is 150 feet, where the existing lot frontage is 142.5 feet. The required minimum lot depth is 300 feet. Um, whereas the existing lot depth is 275 feet. The required minimum front yard setback for a principal building is 100 feet, whereas the existing building has a front yard setback of 57.1 feet. The required minimum side yard setback for a principal building is 30 feet, whereas the existing building has a side yard setback of 24.82 feet. 
The required minimum year, uh, minimum rear yard setback for an accessory structure is 50 feet, whereas the proposed trailer containers is 11 feet. The required minimum side yard setback for an accessory structure is 30 feet, whereas the proposed trailer containers is 11 feet. That's a, repeated. The required minimum parking setback from a residential property line is 20 feet, whereas the proposed stone parking area in the rear of the property is 11 feet. The required minimum parking setback from a non-residential property line is 10 feet, whereas the existing drive aisle is 2.9 feet. And number 11, the height of the garage shall be provided to determine compliance. Um, for, the, for that purpose, I, I presume that the height will be compliant with the, the principal structure of a maximum of 50 feet and maximum height of accessory structures at 25 feet. Would that be a fair representation? So you have 24 feet for the uh, uh, garage. 24 feet? Yep. Thank you. So that's compliant with the zone. <clears throat> That was the list. So we have a motion and a second. Mr. Murphy just listed all of the required variances. Um, so just to be clear, we're voting on preliminary and final site plan and that all the variance be assumed in the resolution. Did I word that properly? Yeah, what you're voting for is preliminary and final site plan approval with the required C variances that I just listed. Any additional comments or anything else for discussion? Through the chair. Mr. Book. Sure. Uh, I think one of the older plans that we saw uh, that, that we're alluding to, I have one of those maybe it was 622.3, I think that's what Mr. Hill was talking about, where it showed the exterior proposed trailer, and a lot of the internal stuff was already there, but then by virtue of the newer drawing, that you see up on the screen, if you blocked out where the, uh, where the trucks would be, uh, where the trailers would be, and that I think is, is very good, very, very positive. Uh, our engineer is satisfied with the circulation, site circulation, and what needs to be uh, moved and how it can be moved. I think it's an improvement. I think it helps. Uh, it helps us get a better sense of what's going on here and how it's going on. And within the context of the, of the uh, uses around it, uh, it, 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 it it seems to me that the general purposes of zoning are satisfied. It seems to me that it was, it's in the best, best interest of uh, general welfare. Again, given what's going on around it and given these improvements and, the, uh, and now the greater specificity as to where these different items would be. So with that, I'd be inclined to approve the uh, applicants. Any additional questions or comments for discussion? Given that there are no additional questions or comments, I'm going to ask you to do a roll call, please. Mr. Hurley? Yes. Mr. Stafford Smith? Yes. Mr. Book? Yes. Mr. Hudak? Yes. Ms. Parnas? Yes. Mr. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Bradley? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to move on to application number four after we take a 10 minute break. So we'll be back at nine o'clock. Thank you.
suitability to accommodate such things as a stormwater management basin, um, <clears throat> accommodate the proposed improvements from a grading perspective. I don't know what the existing grades are here. I don't know what the proposed grades are. I suspect, because I've seen the site, that the, the proposed grades will mimic existing. Uh, but again, um, it, it would be nice to have a more detailed plan showing that um, you could always subject any approval on a site plan, just like we saw earlier, and come back. Um, but a perfect, I guess what I'm getting at, a perfect example is the prior applicant came with a plan that was pretty much 60, 70% designed as part of the use variance application. And in this case, we have a concept plan. Um, so again, we have no soils data to substantiate if, if the stormwater management facility can be accommodated in that location. Uh, we, landscape buffering, I, this is la landscape buffering. I don't know where those are going, what it consists of, and where. Uh, we don't know about refuse containers. Um, th those I don't see depicted on the plan. Uh, site lighting, I don't see any depicted on the plan. And uh, look, I, I, th I think those of you who have known me long enough here, we, we, I, I'm really trying to strive to get to that 50, 60 percent mark with engineering details on a use variance plan because I think that, that that goes to show that the site could be adequately suited to accommodate the proposed use. Now, unfortunately, our checklist doesn't require that level of information to be submitted to be deemed complete. However, we've gone back and forth with applicants in the past to ask them to provide that additional information on, on use variants, on bifurcated use variants applications. So, um, uh, and, and there's been instances where applicants would reach out um, prior to, and we'd have a TRC meeting with them, and, and we'd go over all that so we don't have to do it for the first time at a meeting. So uh, those are my only those are my only comments on, on to the board at this stage. I would note that yes, they are going to need stormwater management facilities because they're proposing more than a quarter acre of impervious cover. May, may I just respond to that? I, I just um, respectfully th this application was, and we've worked very well with your professionals. We, we don't have a review letter from Mr. Hill's office, so we would have in this application has been carried several times, so respectfully, we, we could have worked those out before tonight. Mr. Peters, any comments, questions? Mr. Hopkins? Any additional questions or comments for Mr. Hopkins? Would you like to call your next witness? Our next witness will be Tian Jones, the co-applicant. Good evening, Mr. Jones. If you would please, you can grab that mic and raise your right hand. That would be great. Thank you very much. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony, information, questions, or comments that you're about to present before the board will represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. If you would please state your name, spell your last, uh, provide your affiliation to this application. My name is Tian Jones, uh, J-O-N-E-S. Um, I'm the, um, the resident at the uh, property and the, uh, the person running the business. And I presume that he's being uh, presented as a fact witness? Yes. Thank you very much. And before you get, Mr. Jones, just before you get started, just remember to hold that to your mouth because the acoustics in here stink, so it's hard for us to hear. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ernie. Okay, uh, Mr. Jones, um, can you tell the board your relationship to the co-applicant, Carol Nokiolo? I'm her son-in-law. Okay, and do you reside at 30 Castle Road? Yes, I do. And who do you reside there with? Um, her, um, the um, owner's uh, daughter-in-law, Ashley Nokiolo. 
and your children. And my two children. And um, it's your intention, you live there now, it's your intention to raise your family there? Yes. Okay. Now, we're here today asking the board for approval to allow you to have your residence on that property, but also to run a business on that property. Is that correct? Yes. And um, the board, for the board's edification, can you give them an overview of the business that you are uh, you know, running on that site? Um, yes. Yes. Um, it's an auto refurbishment business, and essentially I buy cars and repair them and, sell, and list them mostly on, for sale on the internet. Um, and we also uh, sell uh, used parts from spare parts cars, and that's about it. Okay, well, let's, let's get into some detail. Uh, the site itself, as Mr. Hopkin indicated, has the residence, and it also has a garage, correct? Yes. How, approximately how big is that garage? About 600 square feet. And is the garage the place where you do the work on these automobiles? Yes. And how many automobiles can you fit in that garage? One. Um, now, as far as your business is concerned, how many employees do you have? Zero. Do you have any intention on adding any employees? No. Um, with regard to your hours of operation and the dates that you work, can you tell the board what those are? Um, I pretty much work um, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. Um, there have been some pickups after hours, but that, that's about it. Now, again, you say you buy these cars, you fix them up to sell. Mm -hmm. Um, do, do you have foot traffic? Do customers come and go from your property? Um, probably about three to four customers a week um, are on the property, but not much more than that. Is that by appointment? Everything is by appointment. There's no one that's allowed to just come on the property as they please. With regard to the work that you do on these cars, um, explain to the board what you do. Uh, do you do body work? No, I do, I do solely mechanic work. I, there is no body work or paint involved. It's only mechanical things that I do. Um, with regard to any hazardous substances, substances, do you do any oil changes on the cars? I, I, I don't um, do oil changes. If I do a repair and there is oil in the car, it's drained, and it's put into a 55-gallon barrel that is uh, emptied by um, a company when it is full. Do you have any type of waiting room or showroom on the premises for these automobiles? No, everything's by a drop-off only. Uh, how, if you're going to sell an automobile, how do you market it for sale then? Um, the, the internet, is, is like Facebook Marketplace or any other um, sites that allow to post the uh, for sale of vehicles. Uh, do you get deliveries of auto parts to your site? Um, very seldom. Um, it's usually by like a pickup truck or a s small van. It's not, never really a um, big truck. And how often do you get those type of deliveries? Maybe once or twice a month. Um, how, how are the automobiles transported to your, to your site? Uh, I, have my own, um, my, I have my own truck, and I use my uh, trailer to move any vehicle that I need to bring in. When you say you have your own truck, is it a tow truck? No, it's a, um, a 3,500 pickup truck. Do you have any intention on expanding this use beyond this garage? No. And, and with regard to the automobiles, um, explain for the board, how many automobiles do you have on site? What do you do with them? 
Um, I, I, I generally have about 10 automobiles at, at max. Um, pretty much, um, they're, they're fixed, they're repaired, and sold. Well, where do you put these automobiles? So they're, all, they're all kept behind um, the garage. To the rear of the property? Yes. And um, do you display them, any cars for sale? Um, I have in the past, but I probably wouldn't go in, a, in the future. And cer certainly if this board restricted you from doing so, you would do that, correct? Correct. Um, with regard to, um, you also said you also sell auto parts, so how does that work? Um, pretty much, uh, so some of the parts go through eBay, so they're removed, packaged, and then taken to the shipper. Um, and there's very seldom local sale people. It's mostly a lot of eBay and a lot of shipping. When an automobile comes on the site, how long does it typically stay there? Um, it depends on the nature of what it needs, honestly. I, like, some, a vehicle could be there a week, a vehicle could be there two months. I mean, it, I mean a vehicle could have a back order part or something that it, you can't physically um, get it done in a lot of time. But typically speaking, you're talking about in the range of 10 automobiles at any given time? Yes. And they're stored behind the garage? Yes. Um, and you also live on this site. Your, your residence is adjacent to the garage, correct? Correct. And when I say adjacent, I don't mean attached. You can see it on that plan that's up there. Um, it's in close proximity to the garage, correct? Yes. And you have small children that you uh, want to have a ability to have a yard to play in, correct? Correct. Um, so is it important that um, if the board were to approve this use, that ultimately when the site is uh, developed, that it be done in a way where you can enjoy your residence and your family life, but also have a, a, a clean, tidy, for lack of a better word, uh, running business. Yes. And again, with regard to any um, hazardous substances, um, outside of the oil you discussed, is there any other thing that uh, we should know about? No. Um, and again, you say there's typically three to four people a week that may come to your site? Yeah, well, that, that's a busy week. Some, yeah. Sometimes it's only one person, sometimes, like, sometimes it's one person in two weeks. It's not, it's not a big scale business. It's more at the hobbyist level. Um, and would all the work take place inside the garage? Yes. So you wouldn't be doing any work on cars outside the garage? And it's your testimony that you're not um, seeking to uh, add any employees. Correct. And you're the sole employee. Correct. Um, at this time, I don't have any further questions of Mr. Jones. Any questions or comments for Mr. Jones? Any questions or comments for Mr. Jones? Through, through the chair. Mr. Stafford Smith. Yes. Is, is there any storage of motor oil, antifreeze, gasoline? Um, the only storage is, is literally inside the garage. There is a 55-gallon drum that it's, I don't move that drum. It, the guy comes, he has a, um, a pump truck, and he pumps it out the barrel. There's no, I don't uh, store oil anywhere else on the property. Right, no lithium battery storage. You ju you work in just gas cars, not electric. Correct. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments for Mr. Jones? Uh, yes. How, when you said you have ten cars that you 
repaired and those that sit there waiting for sale that you store in the back? Um, yes, I was going to say, uh, um, the 10 cars that are, I would say, some are at different stages because, like, no, they're not all done. Um, but, yeah, there are different, it, I have about 10. So that includes cars that are done and cars that are <laughs> Correct. Be worked on. You don't have 20 cars, 10 and 10. You know? Co correct. Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Mr. Peters. The board members are done. I, I, I had a quick question, if that's okay. The storage for the vehicles, is that on the grass or is that on the pavement behind the garage? So right where that fire truck turnaround is, the, the elbow of it, yes. is actually gravel right there. That oh, okay. was already there when we bought the property. And that's right, right about now, that's where they are stored. And even with that fire truck turnaround there, there would still be adequate space. Thank you. Mr. Peters, did you want to make a comment? Mr. Peters? Or well, I was, Mr. Jones, um, I'm sure at some time Mr. Paxson said, someone here is going to ask you a bunch of tough questions. Generally, your neighbors don't like doing that because they're your neighbors, so I get paid to do that. So please, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking for the record. This has to do more with the professionals and it has to do with you, so please don't take it personally. Okay. We just need to make sure that when you're done here, the board, the town, and you know what's been agreed to moving forward. So there's no, you know, you don't lease it out, you don't start doing oil changes, you don't start doing collision repairs, you don't start having 40 cars on the site. So is the garage currently being used for this business? Yes. Okay. What's inside the garage currently? Is, are, are there utilities, you know, water, sewer, electric, the, gas? There's only electric. Okay. Is there a lift in the garage? Yes. Okay. Has the, do you know if the garage has been inspected by the building department for the use that you're using it for? No. Okay. Um, so should the board approve this, you may, if there's a lift, I don't know, is it, is it a mechanical lift or you have one that you put in the concrete and it's like a hydraulic lift? A hydraulic lift. Okay. So if you don't have building permits for that, at some point when you get through this, you're going to need to go to the building department and make sure that what used to be a detached garage can be utilized for automobile repair. The vehicles that you talked about, they're all registered? Not, no. no the, the vehicles in the back of the property are not re registered. Okay. So that brings us to the point about how long they're going to stay there. Because what happens is you, you cross this imaginary threshold into it being a salvage yard, a junkyard. And that's not what you and your team put together and told the board you were going to do. So we need to sort of put it, if, if a vehicle is registered, that's great. If a vehicle comes in as a junker and you fix it up or you dismantle it, that's not automobile restoration and resale. That's scrapping vehicles, and I think we need to be specific about that. So, Mr. Paxson, to the extent you want to cross-examine your witness to get, we have automobile restoration and resale is what you talked about. If we're taking unregistered vehicles and tearing them down to their limit and reselling those parts, I think we need to have that on the record. Yes, thank you. Are, are any of the vehicles that come in used for their parts alone? Um, yes. And when you talk about how many potential vehicles would you have on the site that you would use for that? Um, I, I try to keep as many not there. Um, so it's like there's three right now. And it, I don't plan on like having additional ones. And, and you understand, Mr. Peters, comments that the board doesn't want to say we're sanctioning you to have a junkyard there, correct? Correct. And that there has to be certain understanding that if you have an unregistered car there, it's not going to stay there for beyond a reasonable time. Correct. Um, and the primary goal is not to have a salvage yard. It's to 
if you have these vehicles there, it's to utilize parts, get those parts out so you can put them in the cars that you're refurbishing, and then get rid of those cars as quickly as possible. Yes. Um, I don't know, Mr. Peters, if you have any yeah, follow-ups. Mr. Pax, I'm, I'm not sure if that information was available to the zoning officer when you determined what you're asking for, and it certainly didn't appear that that's what was listed in your statement of operations. My concern is that your client may need a junkyard license to salvage vehicles. I don't know. I just, if, if he was bringing cars in and fixing them and sending them back out and they're all registered, that's automobile repair. Or restoration, or resale. But taking an, an unregistered vehicle and taking the parts off, I think that's something else. And I, I can't tell you what it is because I'm not the zoning officer, right. but it sounds like something else. And I think we need to sort of be clear about that as we move forward. I'm not saying it's a fatal flaw in the app. I'm just saying we need to be specific and, and put conditions of approval on that such that we don't run into a problem later on where he's got 10 vehicles and he's you know, bringing in junk cars. And people say, hey, you guys approved a junkyard. I don't think that's what this application was submitted as. No, it's understood and it's, and it's fair. Um, and again, it's not your intention to have a junkyard. Would you, and, and again, can you do this without using vehicles like that for parts? And, and, and if, if you need them, just tell the board, now's the time. I was gonna say the, part, the parts cars do make it a lot easier. You know, for especially on cars that are older, that parts are hard to find. I, I mean, as far as registering them, I mean, do you mean as in register them or as in titling them? Because like, do they all have to get plates? Like, because when you're reselling, normally you don't you use a dealer plate or like instead of physically registering like a car to that. Wait, if that makes any sense. Well, where do you get the cars? I normally buy them off of other people or if, if from an auction, the, like, so like they, they could easily, like if it were some, if that was the case, it could easily be titled, retitled without like physically registering it on, on the road. <laughs> But you're willing to work with the board to figure out what you're allowed to do here and what parameters we'd have to put on, on the use of these types of vehicles. Yes. Um, Thank you, Mr. Paxton. The real concern is once you start dismembering vehicles, we have no idea where they came from. We have no idea what fluids are in them. We have no idea. I don't know if you, you keep a transmission, you keep it outside, it rains, it ends up, the petroleum products end up in the ground. So the, the, there's a, a concern about how the salvaged materials are stored. You know, if you only have a 600 square foot garage, but you have 10 cars outside, well, if you've got radiators and car doors, and I don't, I don't know what that is, but at some point in time, this isn't restoration and resale, it's, I don't use the word, I forget what the other word for junkyard is, salvage. So it doesn't, not a negative connotation, it's just what it is, and let's just be clear about it so we don't have a problem, we spend all this time and effort, and two days after he's open, someone else comes out and cite him again for having a junkyard when he's not supposed to have a junkyard. So I think we probably incumbent on, upon your group to get a better explanation for us, whether it's at the use variance or the site plan, where salvaged parts are going to, and where and how salvaged, salvaged parts are going to be stored. I'm not sure it should just be on stone. Yeah. So. And I appreciate those comments. And the, um, the last just question I have is that um, in the statement of operations, and I guess I'm asking it to Mr. Jones through you, Mr. Paxton, it said it's a home-based business. Um, but. Honestly, it's, it's not in the house, it's in a garage. It's not in the house, but it's in an ancillary structure to the house, um, which I believe um, actually in the ordinance it also 
indicates that, that would suffice. Thank you. That's all I have for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Chair. Mr. Book. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Jones, I'm still having a little trouble understanding what it is you want to do there. So first I want to go back to um, a question that was asked in terms of fluids. If you're, if you're doing repairs and refurbishment and you're not changing oil but you're storing oil uh, and you're putting a car up on a lift, that's an indicator to me that you're at least draining oil from the car. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. Uh, and so if you're draining oil from the car, are you not then putting oil in the car if you intend to sell it? Well, yes. So that's a change, you're changing oil at the car. Okay. Second thing is uh, other fluids would be transmission fluids. If you pick up a car and it's got a transmission problem, are you attending to the transmission problem? Are you, are you repairing it? Yes. So that may also require you to drain transmission fluids. Storing transmission fluid on site. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, that would be in a different 55-gallon drum. I presume you would no. you could mix it with the oil drum. Yeah. Well, um, most of the petrol, all the petroleum-based stuff, um, that can be put in the same container, okay. but and it's all like it basically it's all picked up by the same guy. Okay. And so, and then we get to the other fluid in the vehicle, which would be the or do you also come upon vehicles that you're dealing with that you have to drain the coolant or you're changing out of radio or whatever the case may be? Are you dealing with that fluid as well? Yes. So you have to somehow capture all that fluid so it doesn't end up getting on the ground as you've heard before. Correct. So now in terms of the work that you're doing in the garage, are you doing any cutting or welding? Do you have acetylene torches? Do you have any type of plasmas cutters? Anything like that in your garage? I, I do have an acetylene torch. Right. Cutting in the garage? Are you set up for no, and whatnot? Just in not case? cutting. Not cutting? No, ju just for, it's just for heat, for like um, exhaust systems have severely rusted bolts, and it's so it's just to do the job. It's not for anything but you're beyond that. If you need it, you use it. Yes, sir. So, in terms of the actual repairs that you're doing, so if it's a transmission issue, are you handling the transmission issue, or do you are you giving that out to another mechanic? I, I'm handling it. You handle it. Uh, is there ever a time when you call in somebody else to assist you with any type of a mechanical issue that you're encountering on a vehicle? No. Right, so you're handling transmissions. Are you doing major major engine overhaul in that garage? Yes. Right, so you're you're pulling heads off. You're doing valves. Do you have cutting machines uh, in order to, mm. to, to cut new valves? No, th that, that, that I do take to a uh, professional machine shop. You're doing brake jobs? Yes. Uh, do you use outside lifts, outside jacks? Are you doing any work outside? No. And so you're able to do all of this work inside that 600 square foot frame garage? Yes. Do you have any training, mechanical training, or certified in any of these areas? I've, I've been a mechanic my entire adult life, which is about 12 years. I've worked for multiple shops over the course of the years. So a lot of experience. You gained experience over time working in these different jobs. But my question, I guess, is did you ever take any types of tests to become certified in any of these areas? No. All right. Uh, thank you. Madam Lady. Mr. Jones, just so that I'm clear, you purchase, you'll purchase a vehicle maybe at an auction or just privately, and the vehicle is inoperative, and you repair it. Correct. Once repaired, then you sell it. Yes. Do you ever purchase a vehicle that was operative and just sell it as a used car? It's rare, but it, it, it does happen. So you do? Yes. Okay. Um, along the lines of questions that, that Mr. Peters asked, if, if you got an inoperative vehicle, and let's say it had an air conditioning unit, and I have no idea what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> if, if you get an air conditioning unit, you can say, I can use this in another vehicle, and you take it off the vehicle that you purchased. Do you, do you accumulate these, these parts and sell them? Or do you strictly use them for your own purpose? It's. Oh, I'm sorry. 
So, I'm sorry, I... I, I, the, I the, question, the question is, if you were to take a, a, a piece of equipment off a vehicle that you purchased, but didn't at that time need it for a car that you're working on, would you hold that piece and just sell it outright to someone who may need it? Um, y yes and no. Like, some, it, it, it would depend on the situation. Sometimes if, if I'm on, um, if someone like contacts me on Facebook and they need that part, yes, I would sell it to them. But like a lot of times you wind up doing like repetitive vehicles. So like, if you know, like, for instance, a 2007 Grand Cherokee is a good selling vehicle, you keep doing it, but then you wind up having your own kind of inventory of parts for it. Well, I guess that's my question. I mean, you have an inventory of parts that you may utilize for your own vehicles that you've purchased, but could you, do you offer those for sale to the public? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hofstein. Okay. Um, the, the parts that you get, do you, do you get them from the manufacturer? Do you get them from junkyards? Um, a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of parts that you get from the manufacturer, and it, it, it really, it once again, it depends on the part. It depends on the price of the part. Honestly, mm -hmm. if the manufacturer wants a lot of money, you know, you're not gonna really turn a profit if you know you pay you pay more than what the car is worth or something but so sometimes you might have to use another salvage like a salvage company to get a part okay then then you're replacing a part that can't be used with the new part therefore correct. you couldn't sell a part you took off if, if it doesn't work well correct and then at that point it would be taken to the scrapyard okay when you said that you don't do body work on cars? No, I, I, all, all my experience is in mechanical. Like, I, 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 like, I don't uh, do like any kind of like heavy body repairs or I don't do anything that involves paint. Like, I mean, I, have I put a bumper on a car? Yeah, I was gonna say, but that's kind of part of the business of refurbishing cars, you know, if you have to, put a bumper or a fender on it, but I don't, I don't pull frame. I don't do any, I don't do anything structural. Okay, so you, 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 you're not doing collision work. Is, is Correct, it? it's, it's okay. auto repair really. Okay. And you don't do, or do you do any painting? I, I do not do paint. Okay, so when, when somebody comes in to buy a car and it's running fantastically and it looks like it was in a wreck, uh, how do you handle that? I, I, it's, it's more of kind of handled on the other end where it's just like, I just, I try to pick cars that just have mechanical problems. Like, like solely if you went to the mechanic and you needed a transmission and you were like, you know what? I'm done with this car, I'm gonna go get a new one. Well, if you took care of your car and it's very clean inside and out, to me, it might be worth putting a transmission in it. But like, essentially, like it's not, if, if the body is not in good shape, it's not really usually worth it. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Well, I think you said, I just want to hear, what you don't do is if uh, I'm Joe Public and I give you a call, say, oh, I need an oil change on my car, I want you to do an overall safety check on it, change the tires, put on some new wheels. You don't do that. You are not mm -hmm. taking calls from the public to do that kind of mechanical. No, I, I, I do not do that. Any additional questions or comments? Mr. Hyman. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple times about the parts. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the parts aspect of this business. When you're purchasing your vehicles, you're purchasing the, some of them for parts for other vehicles that you want to repair. Are you purchasing the vehicles or at least some of the vehicles to sell those parts. I think you mentioned that on that you've sold them on eBay or something like that. Is that are you doing one? Are you doing the other? Are you doing both? Is this 
are you buying cars to sell the parts or you're only buying the cars for parts for your own parts to repair the other vehicles? Uh, it's, it's more of to buy to repair another vehicle and then what I don't use is, is a lot of times what I take off the car and then list on eBay before I get rid of the rest of the car. So, so when you're working, let's say, on the Grand Cherokee and you need certain parts, you're going to buy a second one so that you could get those parts from there and then sell the rest of those parts of that Grand Cherokee? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Uh, I think you know, Mr. Book just mentioned, I was going to ask that before. So any external mechanic work, he just mentioned oil change, you're not doing any kind of mechanic work for anybody else other than the cars that you're working to resale or resell. I was going to say, um, I don't do like oil changes. I was going to say, it, some, there are clients that I've had for years that, you know, sometimes they do need a bigger job done. That's usually the only time people contact me is like, I usually do the bigger stuff, but like, I'm not like a jiffy loop. Like I don't want the I don't want the volume. So you are a general mechanic doing work for private customers as well, not just for your own repairs to resell the vehicles. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Would you like to call your next witness? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, at this time, the request if we could have this matter adjourned and carried to the next meeting or next month, I, I, you know, in, in accordance with the board's agenda, um, so that we can address certain issues and bring this back to the board um, for uh, certain clarifications. So interestingly, Mr. Paxson, for some reason I was only given the agenda for the next meeting, and I will tell you that it will not be the <laughs> The next meeting. If you'll give me one second, let me pull up the future agendas. You have them?
So in the interest of full disclosure, I will not be here on May 1st. I will not be here May 1st. So. Uh, it, ex it, no. Excuse me, um, Mr. Jones just indicated he will not be here May 1st. Wonderful, me state. neither. <laughs> May 15th would May 15th. be fine, yeah. Does May 15th work? That, that's fine. Actually, yes, this, this would, uh, we started Faraday. I'll put you on for, I'll put you on for number one. Thank May, you. May 15th. Thank this you. Is the, you're the oldest application by far. Okay. Thank uh, you, So I, let me make, oh, hold on. Do we want to open to the public first? About anything we heard? I, I, I understand that's a silly question, but. Just to keep things clear, I'm going to open the meeting to the public. If there's anyone wishing to come forward about what was already testified to, please feel free to do so at this time. Seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close public session and Mr. Murphy will make his announcement. Thank you. Just a sidebar, uh, I'll talk to you after, after the, I carry this. All Very right. good, thank you. Um, okay, application number four. 30 Cassville Road, uh, Caro Nochilio, and I apologize, Nochilio, um, block 17302, lot 19, uh, in the NC zone. That application is being carried to the May 15th, uh, 2024 meeting of the Jackson Township Zoning Board of Adjustment. No further notice will be required. Applicant waves time. Yes. And they'll be listed as number one. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Everybody you. have a safe trip home. Sounds, you as well. sounds bad out there. So no notice is required at this point. Oh, you're going to talk to them. Okay. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. See you in a couple weeks. Thank you.